On behalf of my colleagues on the board of the SEC Historical Society, I want to welcome everyone joining us today for this special program. The Commissioner's Advocates, Ferber, Gonson, Stillman, and the SEC Solicitor's Office. My name is Joan McCown, and I'm currently a partner at Jones Day. A good part of my career, however, was spent at the SEC when I started in 1986. In 1993, I was named Chief Counsel of the Division of Enforcement, and I served in that role until I left the commission in 2010. In addition to my day job at Jones Day, I'm also chair of the SEC Historical Society's Board of Trustees. If you're unfamiliar with the SEC Historical Society, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're not legally affiliated with the SEC, but we obviously share an appreciation of the agency's mission. The society works to preserve and share the history of the US securities markets and we do this by virtually expanding the collection of unique materials in the virtual museum at seChistorical.org. The museum is freely accessible to anyone with internet access, and I urge you to take a look if you haven't already. It's a tremendous resource. And now I want to introduce you to our program moderator, Dr. Kenneth Doerr. Ken is, has 30 years of experience as a historical consultant. He has written 13 books, co-authored five, and edited many more. He has conducted hundreds of oral history interviews, many for the Society, and has curated six of the galleries in the Virtual Museum, and is currently working on his seventh gallery, focused on the history of the SEC's regional offices. Ken, thank you for the many projects you've helped the Society with over the years, and your role in moderating today's program. Ken will introduce them in greater detail, but I also want to express the Society's gratitude for the participation of our distinguished panelists, each of whom served with, or currently serves as, as in the case of Michael Connolly, with great distinction as General Counsel of the SEC. With that, Ken, I'll turn it over to you and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Joan. And thank you to everyone who's logged in for what should be an informative and engaging program. For 57 years, the solicitor has been the SEC's advocate, representing the commission in coordination with the DOJ through amicus briefs and in oral arguments before the appellate courts and in years past the Supreme Court. The organizational history is simpler than most. There was no formal solicitor's position at the outset. A uh, short-lived reorganization during the 1940s eliminated the office of, Ge of general counsel and created an office of the solicitor instead, uh, but it was short-lived. The position as we know it now today emerged during the 1960s, and it was shaped by three men with remarkably long tenures of 15, 19, and 17 years respectively. David Dave Ferber joined the SEC in 1942. In 1964, he was named to the newly created position solicitor in the office of the general counsel. Ferber served as solicitor until 1979. Paul Gonson joined the commission staff in 1961 and served as solicitor from 1979 to 1998. Jake Stillman joined the SEC only a year after Gonson, succeeded him as solicitor and remained in the position until 2015. To discuss the achievements of these three solicitors, we are fortunate to have four men with us today who work very closely with them. Let me start with David Becker, since he's popped up on our screen there. David joined the commission in 1998 as Deputy General Counsel and was General Counsel from 2000 to 2002. He served a second two-year stint from 2009 to 2011. Harvey Pitt served on the commission staff from 1968 to 1978, spending the last three years as General Counsel. In 2001, he returned to the SEC as chairman, serving until 2003. Dan Gelzer joined the SEC in 1974, served as general counsel from 1983 to 1990, and was a founding member and acting chair of the PCAOB. And Michael Conley joined the SEC in 2000 and succeeded Jake Stillman in 2015. In addition to taking on the position of acting general counsel, Michael continues to serve as SEC solicitor and continues to build on the legacy of Ferber, Gonson, and Stillman. So gentlemen, let's talk about that legacy. And I wanna 
kind of take it back a little bit and talk about the institutional context and explore a little bit. Um, and, and a bit of speculation will be in order, I think, here. Um, explore a little bit about the institution of the SEC and what may have been behind the creation of the solicitor's position within the office of the general counsel back in the 60s. Harvey, you were you were close to the that period. Your thoughts? Well, it. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, a fascinating time when I became uh, general counsel. Uh, Dave Ferber uh, had been the solicitor in the general counsel's office because of Dave's long service. It was thought in deference to Dave that the position should be elevated with the title solicitor to the commission. And I will say that um, David was unique. Um, he was uh, my first introduction to the um, practice of law when I started at the SEC. And working with David was um, a surreal experience. Um, when you uh, drafted a brief, um, uh, my initial thought as a brand new uh, lawyer was I had finished my work. Uh, but what I learned with David was that was just the beginning of my work. Uh, after David had a chance to read the brief, we would all meet in Dave's office. He had a long conference table and we would all be there, all of the people who worked on the brief and a very critical person, Diana Barry, who was his secretary. Um, uh, Dave had a, um, an old fashioned stapler uh, which was gold and uh, doesn't look like modern staplers. There um, were no um, uh, uh, computers in those days. And in fact, um, there wasn't even um, active uh, copying machines. Everything was wet copy. And you would sit there and I remember starting on a brief and First sentence was, um, the issues in this case commenced, and I was um, about to doze off when David said, should we say commenced or began? I thought to myself, why on earth would that matter? But to David, every word was an art form. And he fussed uh, over every single formulation and he was meticulous in the way he did that. So every sentence of fact had to be supported. The choice of words had to be absolutely correct. Um, Diana Barry sat there, David would be working uh, with his uh, stapler and uh, punching uh, with his fist the um, knob on it and eventually um, a cut and paste job would be put together and then it was left to Diana Barry to actually create the final product in the uh, Southern District of New York and in many of the circuit courts initially, briefs um, had to be um, uh, original copy and we had worked out a way to have our print shop create actual initial or original copies so that none of the whiteouts and the tapings and any of that stuff um, could be seen. By the end of my first experience, I had learned that there was a lot more to writing a brief than I had thought. And uh, every single effort with David remained the same. He was consistent. We would work starting early in the morning at 12. 
we would leave for lunch at a restaurant called Hendrix, uh, where there was one waitress named Dolly who would wait on Mr. Dave, as she called him. Uh, he got much more preferential treatment than anybody else in that restaurant. We would go back to work, and then we would finish up at 5.30. Well, Harvey, you mentioned that, that um, Dave was made a solicitor to the commission um, at, at a certain point. And I should point out that, that when, he, when the position was created, uh, he was officially the solicitor to the general counsel. And, and then that changed a short time later. Uh, Dan, you knew uh, Dave, Dave Ferber. Um, I, I get the idea that being detail-oriented, being driven, it has something to do with success in that appellate side of the general counsel's office. What else did you see from Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Har Harvey's description of, of working with Dave on a, on a brief is, is spot on, is perfect. If you'd let me, Ken, I, could I back up for just a second and talk absolutely. about the first two people to have the title of solicitor? I know they're not really our topic today, but I, I think they're worth remembering because I think they were important in the commission's history. I'll, yeah, I'll be brief on that point. But John F. Davis was appointed as solicitor in 1942 at apparently a time when the commission decided to take all of the functions of the general counsel's office and send them to the divisions so that all that was left was appellate litigation. He, he uh, went into the Coast Guard, I understand, in 1944, and Roger Foster then became solicitor, who was then, his title was changed back to general counsel sometime in the early 50s. I learned all this because at the time of the commission's 50th anniversary, we tried to gather information about the history of the office and who had been in it. And uh, a man named Homer Kripke, who was a well-known securities academic, sent a letter pointing these things out. Just as footnotes to them, John F. Davis had a very distinguished post-SEC career. He was the clerk of the U.S. Supreme Court from 1961 to 1970, and among other things, swore in Thurgood Marshall. I understand mm -hmm. a portrait of Davis uh, somewhere at the Supreme Court. Um, he was in the Solicitor General's office and argued 50 times before the Supreme Court. And uh, for those with an interest in the period, he represented Alger Hiss before the House on American Activities Committee and in his uh, prosecution in the Southern District of New York for, for perjury. Roger Foster, Harvey will remember because uh, Harvey may have met him before this, but he and I met him in the 70s when he was part of a team suing the commission to compel us to adopt environmental disclosure requirements. There's a DC Circuit opinion called NRDC versus SEC on that point. Um, which may turn out to have a lot of resonance these days as the commission um, moves to adopt climate-related disclosures. So I just, I, I, I didn't, we, we won't say more about those two, but I didn't want to leave them um, behind. Uh, uh, th th again, there's not much I can add to what Harvey said about Dave Ferber. I, maybe I would say, um, in hopefully a gentle way, he had a reputation for having a somewhat quick temper. And I think most of the staff attorneys basically lived in fear of, of Dave Ferber. I know that the way that I got a private office as a young staff attorney in the office was that the office immediately across from Dave became available. The staff attorneys then were all sharing offices. They went through everyone in order of seniority and asked them if they would like to move to the office across from Dave Ferber. Everyone said no until they got to me, the most junior person in the. I um, started in that office as well, Dan. Okay, well, I, I think it worked out very well because the, you know, despite the, his 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 gruffness, I'd say we eventually became, I would say, friends, and I got to go along on some of those uh, lunches that that Harvey mentioned. Um, I guess one thing I would add, uh, or two things I guess I would add about working with him on a brief was. I always felt it was a great accomplishment at the end of the process when you read the final brief, if you could find three words in a row that had been in your initial draft, because I mean, everything was was edited to a, 
to a fairly well as as Harvey had described, although of course it was a hundred times better than the initial draft. The other thing that I, I learned from Dave was that every brief had to have a preliminary statement. After the court read the preliminary statement, it should have made up its mind that it was going to rule in the commission's favor. And the only reason for reading the rest of the brief was to get the, the facts and law that the court would need to put in its opinion in order to support the commission's position. Would uh, Paul Gonson have had the same tutelage that you, you two are both talking about? Well, Paul certainly would have worked with, with the, I, Paul was a much different personality. I, I, I don't recall ever hearing Paul Gonson raise his voice in the office. Um, I'm not sure I recall too many times when Dave wasn't raising his voice in, in the office. And, and Paul, I mean, I certainly was never involved in that kind of word for word, line by line, comma by comma editing of appellate briefs that that Dave Ferber was involved in. But I, I think you know, Paul would have, I think, learned at, at uh, Dave's knee the way many of us did. How did uh, Paul's approach to uh, putting, uh, def defending a case, making the SEC's case, how did it differ from somebody like Dave Ferber's? Anyone, anyone. I guess um, I, I would say uh, there were there were several aspects, and and some of this relates to personality. Um, Dave strongly believed, and with good reason, that if we said it in a brief, and his name was on the brief, the court was going to believe it. That's why he was so meticulous about what went in the brief and how it was expressed. Um, my view of Paul was, um, Paul was, uh, I, I agree with Dan, personality-wise, um, uh, Paul and Dave Ferber were um, uh, really almost um, polar opposites, but um, Paul um, was very uh, intent on making sure that the contents of the brief were as accurate as they could be, but he believed that we had the burden and um, uh, as the law changed and as cases came and went, his approach, uh, at least when I worked with him, was to justify everything we could and then we could decide what to take out um, or not. Um, the other thing about Paul that was frightening, I started out working with and for Paul when I started at the commission, and basically the first week we had a brief and we had to go down to the print shop, and everyone knew Paul by first name, greeted him that way, and these were people on the late night shift, and it was very clear to me. I was going to be working around the clock, and that um, uh, was the way Paul did things. I think Dave had more of a regimen um, in that sense, and Paul took whatever time was available to get the work done. I, I, I just to add I mean, to, to me, Dave Ferber was a, a master craftsman of appellate brief writing, and he was totally immersed. In, in that area. I, I think Paul, even while his title was solicitor, played a much broader role at the at the commission than Dave did. I, I, th I think while I was general counsel, at least his title was uh, deputy general counsel and solicitor, or maybe the other way around. And, and really, I think in many ways, I thought of him more as, as, as a deputy and someone that I used as a sounding board for ideas and someone who would restrain me from my poorer ideas rather than someone who was you know, solely focused on appellate brief writing. Dave, at least to my recollection, pretty much confined himself to the, to the world of appellate practice. A few other uh, little bits of color. I've heard stories about desks. Um, Paul's desk, Jake Stillman's desk. Anybody willing to go there? Well, I had... Um... 
an interesting thing. Um, um, uh, in Paul's case, his desk was a mess. Um, he had papers all over the desk in various stacks. In Jake's case, just to correct you modestly, it wasn't just his desk. <laughs> it was the entire office, his chairs, um, his bookcases, and whatever. You really have to struggle to be able to sit in Jake's office. I never knew whether that was deliberate or not, but uh, in any event, when um, Paul went on uh, vacation uh, and I was general counsel and his desk bothered me enormously, I got uh, his secretary, uh, Vanya Lewis, and I and my secretary at the time, Phyllis Summers, and we arranged everything in his office, put them in neat stacks, and organized the entire office. When Paul came back, he was thrilled with this, and he thanked me profusely. With Jake, before Jake was about to go on vacation, I said to Jake, Jake, I think I'm going to do for you what we did for Paul Johnson. And he looked at me and said, Harvey, if you do that, I'll quit. <laughs> and I, I will tell you, um, Jake was too valuable ever to run the risk of having him quit. And I said, okay, hands off. I won't touch a thing. Uh, I'm mean, just add, I think with, with Jake, you could go into his office and mention some case from 10 years ago. And despite what seemed to be the mess, he could dive into the right dusty pile of, of papers and pull out the brief or whatever it was that you were asking about. Uh, uh, Harvey and, and, and Dan, could you say something about the relationship between uh, Jake and Paul? Um, uh, did they... Um, I mean, who had the final say on briefs? Um, uh, th did they work well together? I mean, th this the way the positions were at that time, uh, with Paul as um, uh, you know as deputy general counsel, and Jake, at, in addition to being solicitor, and Jake being in charge of the appellate group, you can see a lot of potential for uncertainty about who has the responsibility for what and how you resolve disputes and all that. I, I would say um, um, uh, both Jake um, and Paul were um, wonderful uh, personalities and easy to work with. Um, as I, in the uh, instance I mentioned when I threatened to clean up Jake's office. That's the only time I ever saw him lose his temper. Um, uh, uh, but I thought that they had mutual respect. And I know Paul thought very, very highly of Jake. But the problem with Jake when I was a young lawyer is um, uh, if you went in and discussed the case with him um, in his very methodical, polite, even keeled way, he could rip so many holes in the arguments that you thought were well established. You walked out questioning, why are we even taking this position? I mean, Jake was, he was a master at it. Um, there was one other major difference, um, at least that I noticed. Um, um, and in a way, this cut through all three of them. Uh, for Dave Ferber, um, uh, getting things done on time was a must. For Paul, I would say it was important. Um, for Jake, getting the brief the way he wanted it was paramount. And if you let him, he would take extensions for as long as he could get a court to grant them. Uh, <laughs> and that was always a potential issue. 
I think another further rule is we don't seek extensions because it might signal to the court that there's something difficult or challenging about mm -hmm. this case. So we're going to get everything in within the prescribed time frame. The, the, the others did not have that uh, philosophy. Michael, you would have you would have been uh, come up under Jake in the SEC. Tell me about your experiences. Well, you know, this is very instructive to me hearing about Dave Ferber in particular, because I can see some extraordinary similarities in terms of the brief review process. For those of us who, who never knew Dave, we sort of thought it originated with Jake. Uh, and there was, there's a, um, for people who have worked in the appellate group in recent years under Jake, everyone uh, sort of affectionately referred to the first experience that you have when you've drafted a brief, Jake has taken it has edited it, marked it all up with pencil, and then invited you to his office to talk about it. We talked about it as being jaked because you would enter the office and very often, kind of what Harvey was talking about, you know, it might be several hours before you even got up from the table. And Jake would, you know, probe, it would be an extended rigorous review of the draft, probing for every weakness, testing the thoroughness of reasoning, and a series of questions, which uh, you know started out probably being things you could answer, but it would inevitably come to the, the ultimate unanswerable question, which is, what was the opponent thinking when he or she wrote this? And we would say, Jake, I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Um, but, but I'll say that you know what we learned from Jake uh, in, in going through that process was something critical, again, apparently derived from his experience with Dave and perhaps Paul before, which was that uh, it was critical to make the brief as easy for the reader here at the court to understand and comprehend as possible. And so he would start with the table of contents. And he had the same rule with respect to the, the preliminary statement and then the summary of argument, but he really focused extensively on the table of contents and said that, you know, he, he would go through and say, you should be able to read the table of contents and at the end of it, be clear that we win this case. And just in case, you know, we used to say, what do you think? The judge is only going to read four pages? He said, you never know. And so if that was the only thing that the judge had read, he should emerge uh, clear in the view that we had persuaded uh, the court that we were correct. And so and then I will say also about the, the recall, uh, this is something that Dan mentioned. And, it, and for those who hadn't experienced it, it was truly remarkable. You could be sitting there and you know, you'd be going through a case and Jake would say, Hmm. And he'd lean back and say, you know, there was a case in 1967 in the Second Circuit that we argued, and I believe you'll find in the argument section, it may have been the second, possibly the third argument, that we addressed this point. And so we think, oh, come on, you know, how could I possibly be so? But sure enough, you pull out the brief, turn to the page, and there it would be. And so we had this remarkable recall, which was really useful in making sure that, you know, to the extent the commission or we had said something before, uh, we were aware of it. And, uh, and if possible, you know, could maintain consistency with the argument. That, that, that was even more important, I think, um, when I started out working there, because we didn't have computerized research at the time, but we had something better. We had Jake. <laughs> David, you made an interesting point earlier. I think uh, one of the things that lies behind it is that uh, Jake and, and Paul were really close contemporaries. There wasn't this generational a distance between the two. So I, I think the question of their relationship is interesting because Paul was, you know, the, the, the solicitor for quite a few years with Jake in the background there. Yeah, I mean, the question is, and, and to some extent, by the time I started, this had become moot. 
what 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 does that job as a solicitor entail? And if it's only appellate uh, matters, what about the person who is ostensibly running the appellate section? Um, and one could see how that could be an issue. I uh, now, when shortly after I joined the commission in 1998, uh, Paul announced his retirement, and uh, people can insert obligatory joke there. Um, uh, and so, by that time, there was you know there was absolutely no competition, mutual respect, mutual affection. Um, and then after Paul left, Jake became the uh, solicitor. And I think since then, uh, until very recently, until Michael's tenure, um, well, including Michael's tenure, the solicitor is, has responsibility for the, um, uh, uh, for the appellate group now. Uh, solicitors from time to time have had other responsibilities and other titles, uh, additional titles. Um, Michael being uh, the paradigm who is, while solicitor has uh, managed to gather uh, every title possible short of emperor. Um, and um, that's not so much an artifact of the title of solicitor but the, of the needs in an office at any particular time. Um, so. Well, we've, we've talked about this editing process, I mean, at least to my recollection. I, I, was, I don't remember Paul ever being involved in that kind of meticulous editing. I mean, not that he, I guess, couldn't, couldn't do it or didn't care about the content of the briefs, but he, he relied on Jake, I think, to perform that function in, in a way that Dave Ferber, for example, never would have been willing to rely on, on anyone else to, to you know, put, put, put the detail of touches on the beat. Ken, that I think it's important um, to bring out. While we've been talking about the editing of a policy, um, what I would say is, as a very young lawyer, I learned how to write from Dave Ferber. True, it was only about appellate briefs, and, and Dave really focused only on the brief writing. But um, Dave, Paul, and Jake all cared about how you expressed views and um, I agree with Dan's observations. When Paul would edit a brief, he would give it back to you marked up. Sometimes there were detailed comments, sometimes there were general comments, but he still cared about the writing. And um, one of the things that came out of the general counsel's office was that young lawyers really learned how to express themselves, both in writing and orally. And I think that's a magnificent tradition and one that these um, three and now uh, Michael are carrying on for all of the commission's lawyers. Well, Michael, you're, you're gonna get yourself talked about eventually. You already have. Um, and, and it was nice enough to Dan to bring out a couple of solicitors that, that weren't on the list. Um, and David, I, you know, I think that the time is right. You can talk about, you know, Jake Stillman, who worked for you, um, and also that uh, other up and coming lawyer in the appellate group that, uh, tell us a little bit about those two and, and uh, what, what you saw then and what you see now. Well, uh, Jake was a remarkable man. Uh, he was, and, and everyone has heard this, he was a fabulous uh, appellate advocate. Um, he, he had the thoroughness and, uh, and the attention to detail uh, necessary. He, he, he could be imaginative. Um, uh, and uh, he was a good colleague, um, certainly for me. I... One thing that isn't talked about as is, is much 
is Jake's reputation within the federal government and within the uh, legal department, legal functions of the executive departments, and in particular with the Solicitor General. Jake had long-standing relationships uh, with lawyers all over the government, particularly within uh, the SG's office, and he had very deep long-standing professional relationships of great respect. Um, the one I saw the most was uh, with the Solicitor General. Uh, these guys had worked together on cases over years and years. They had developed, um, they they trusted Jake, they, they were, um, <clears throat> they relied enormously on the, um, uh, on, on, on the breadth of his knowledge. And, um, and uh, he was a straight shooter. Um, so we had very good relationships with, with those offices, even when they didn't agree, uh, necessarily agree with us. But these were discussions on the merits, and Jake gave us uh, a presumption of good lawyering and, and sensible advocacy uh, whenever we had to work uh, with the Solicitor General's office. That's one thing. Uh, another thing about Jake is, which I haven't seen in many lawyers ever, there was a sort of purity to purpose of purpose about Jake. Um, he, he, he did not think of the law and, and particularly his role as um, meeting uh, particular agendas. He was all about the court, the law, and, uh, and the strength of arguments. I remember one time, I hate to say this, but from time to time, commissions have um, taken positions that can be described only as dopey. And um, Jake literally could not understand that they would do that, that there would be considerations beyond the four corners of the case and what was the right outcome, that uh, commissioners would um, adopt positions that made very little legal sense. I remember one time he said to me, don't they understand that... This case had to do with that case, no, no. and the answer that I reluctantly gave him was, "Yeah, they understand, but they they don't care." Um, and and that that happened very rarely. I'm mentioning I'm mentioning this only as an insight into uh, what I think of as as the purity of of Jake as a as a craftsman. Um, um, rather than to say that com the commissions were always doing dopey things. Now, one of the things um, uh, I, uh, that Jake did uh, was to have um, Michael Conley fall in his lap and was smart enough to grasp him. Um, Michael came to the commission in, what was it, Michael, 2000, as a, um, as a fellow, um, a temporary appointment for uh, a year. I don't remember how long. And then I think it was renewed for a second year. And then finally, someone in the general counsel's office, or someone, uh, prevailed on Mike on Michael to stay as a full-time employee and and I am um, extremely pleased uh, when I think of whatever role I played uh, in in making that happen uh, Michael is a um, very 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 smart guy uh, lawyers are always uh, described as geniuses and all this. Michael's about as smart as they get. Uh, and he's about as skilled as they get as a lawyer in terms of lawyer's tools. Um, 
But Michael has other skills. When, I, when, Michael, um, when Michael was promoted to Je deputy general counsel, or I guess even before, Jake was spending less and less time on administrative matters. Truth is, he hated administrative matters and spent as uh, little time on them as possible. And Michael became the leader of, of, of that group in the general counsel's office um, in, in, without in any way supplanting Jake and, by, and showed Jake enormous respect but he, he got the uh, affection and respect of the lawyers in that office in a way that I haven't seen elsewhere uh, in the commission. Um, and he, in turn, uh, stuck, uh, stood up for uh, his people when, from time to time, uh, certain people who had marginal grasp on what was going on, he used to grouse about him in the office. So I don't know anything that he's done since I left. I, I suspect it's all been a disaster, but I am I think he's wonderful. Well, Michael, I've got to give you a chance to talk now. Um, and I had a big question that I wanted to throw out, and it's sort of the obvious historian question is, does the office, does the position shape the men or do the men shape the position? And it occurs to me, Michael, that you can speak from experience there. You know, how much can a, how much can a solicitor shape the, the position and how much does the position determine where he's going to go? So uh, thank you, David, for those um, very kind words. And I will say that the role that you did have in bringing me to the commission was right from the very beginning because mm. I came in, Arthur Laby, who you'll recall, was in the Office of General Counsel at the time. and was the one who reached out to me when we were law school colleagues and, um, and said, you know, there's this new thing we're doing. We're bringing in people from private practice and um, I think you might really like it. And so I said, um, well, okay, I'll come over and talk to you. And he said, he said, let me let you talk to David Becker. And so I went in and I sat down and talked to David and uh, explained the, the role, the idea of this fellowship program, kind of stuff I'd be doing. And then I was getting up to leave and I would walk to the door and David said, oh, one more thing. I just want to tell you that the time that I've had at the commission, he said, you know, I very much enjoyed practicing law, the law where I came from. Uh, I worked with some great people, but I will tell you that I've never had more fun than the time that I've been here. And um, I said, okay, thanks. And that <laughs> really hit me because to talk about the kind of high level legal practice, you know, that, that where important issues are considered and you have an opportunity to participate in it, and really see it as fun. You know, this is a great thing, was something that um, made the greatest impression on me and was the reason I decided to come in that you. conversation. That's very nice. And you still take the position that the contents of that envelope in my on my desk that you took had nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing. nothing. <laughs> uh, and so to, to get back to your question, um, and I think that uh, David spoke to this a bit already. Uh, part of, I think, what happens for any person who occupies really any, any senior position in our office is meeting the needs of the time. And, um, and those have you know, changed or you know, varied, I'll say, over the course of time. And one of the things, for example, that we've uh, confronted more and more uh, is, you know, uh, substantial rulemaking efforts by the commission, which has happened before, but where they've been met by, you know, enormous resistance by the folks who are gonna be subject to these rules. You know, um, sometimes with good cause, I mean, these are gonna result in, you know, substantial changes perhaps in their business model and so on. 
And, um, and the amount of time and the effort that we have devoted to, uh, in the first instance, working with the rulemaking teams, you know, before there's ever a case, you know, we've become involved in the appellate group uh, with the rulemaking teams, trying to help kind of to anticipate some issues that might arise, avoid pitfalls to the extent we can, pay attention to the comment letters that are coming in, which more and more have become basically, you know, opening briefs and challenges to the rules. Um, and that has, has I think, uh, uh, become a pretty substantial part of the work that, that I do and that uh, folks in my office do. I will also say it, it's extremely important to, for me to say this too, that the, the people that I have working now in the appellate group are remarkable. They've always been good lawyers, but I have to say <laughs> they are a remarkable collection of people, extraordinarily talented and very committed and willing to take on just about any project. I mean, they're interested. They're deeply interested in the work that the commission's doing and in being involved in many ways. And that enables me and our office to have, I think, a broader reach and broader involvement, which is you know, good for us and uh, hopefully good for the agency as well. It would be, it seemed to me it would be hard uh, because in my case, it would have been impossible to have been general counsel without Paul Gonson or someone like him as solicitor. I mean, when, when I joined the office, appellate litigation was probably, I don't know, 75, 80% of what it was, what the office was doing. But when, you know, the formation of the counseling group in the late 70s and, and other expansions of the office's responsibility, the general counsel really has spent most of his or her time on on other issues. And frankly, I think the chairman that I worked for wouldn't have been happy if I'd been spending most of my time working on appellate briefs, you know, even if I'd had the capability to to do that. So it's sort of become, I think, a, a essential to have a solicitor and the kind of people that have filled that position in order for the general counsel's office to play the role that it plays at the commission. Well, terrific. This anything else we should um, cover as far as the personalities of these three men uh, and how they ran their offices? Yeah, Harvey. Just uh, uh, as um, I, um, I watched uh, uh, David take off his jacket, it did remind me <laughs> of one uh, significant difference in personalities between um, the three. Uh, prior solicitors. Um, Jake Stroman never, ever took off his jacket. Um, I will not tell you about the questioning that the rest of us in the office did when he was not around about when and where he wore his jacket, but it was very clear that Jake never removed that jacket. Paul Gonson only wore a jacket if he were meeting with outsiders or if he were meeting with the commissioners, etc. cetera. Um, but otherwise, um, Paul did not wear a jacket and Dave Ferber mostly wore a jacket but it wasn't like Jake, it wasn't, I mean, in Jake's case, it was consistent. If you ever saw Jake without his jacket, people would have um, uh, been amazed on the spot. Well, we've talked about Jake's jacket. I'm glad we got to that. Um, we've also talked about Jake's relationships and one of the number one relationships being with the uh, Solicitor General. And I think this is a good place to kind of turn a corner and talk about the relationship of, of the SEC appellate group and the solicitors with the, with the uh, Solicitor General's office. Um, Harvey, you wanna take us back to, to that, the SEC relationship with the Justice Department in your period? 
when um, when I first got there, um, uh, Dave Ferber um, had uh, the same kind of reputation that David has described for Jake. Um, uh, David, um, in particular, worked with one person in the SG's office, Danny Friedman. Um, and uh, they had been collaborating for decades on uh, cases. Um, it made for a very good relationship. The commission um, was all able to argue cases um, on its own. Phil Loomis argued, Dave Ferber argued. I know when um, I was general counsel, I was able to argue um, uh, cases there because the relationship um, uh, was um, positive. Um, I will say that one of Dave's um, great qualities was he was an astute observer of the viability of commission positions. And um, uh, early um, uh, in our uh, tenure together with Dave as solicitor and me as general counsel, the commission had the Sloan case come up for review. Um, uh, everyone who had ever looked at this um, had basically told the commission its position was ludicrous. The commission was given a uh, power uh, to suspend trading in a stock, um, quote, for a period not exceeding 10 days, close quote, in any stock if the commission were concerned that there was not adequate information about it. Um, uh, this fellow Sloan was a broker dealer and um, he had gone out of business uh, because the commission suspended trading in a stock that he was heavily invested in for 10 day periods that range over a year. And um, uh, Sloan took that case uh, to court um, and argued it pro se. And the Second Circuit uh, ruled that um, the commission uh, basically had added three words. We interpreted the statute uh, for a period not to exceed 10 days. We added the words at a time, which of course were not in the statute. Um, uh, at that point, the question was, um, uh, did we want to be told we couldn't use this authority anymore by the Second Circuit, or did we want to be told about this by the Supreme Court? Um, wiser heads would have said, let's leave it at the Second Circuit. Um, but the commission was determined to get that um, provision reviewed. And as soon as the case was filed, um, um, and cert was granted, Dave came into me and my office and said, Harvey, I think you should argue this case. Um, and um, um, I um, uh, approached this um, like the trooper uh, I thought I was supposed to be. I did argue it. We got an incredible result. We lost nine nothing to a pro se non-lawyer. And um, um, I believe in a concurring opinion, uh, one of the justices referred to this as obscurantism run riot. So um, uh, Dave was a very good assessor of the quality of uh, cases and so on. And that helped us realize that we only got 10 days. 
this is interesting because this is a period when the SEC is arguing cases for the Supreme Court. I think I read somewhere that it was the NLRB and the SEC. They were the only agencies that the Supreme Court, you know, welcomed to argue a case. Um, and that certainly peaked, I think, with Paul Gonson. Um, so if it peaked with Paul Gonson, he argued at least four Supreme Court cases. Um, some Somewhere you got the opportunity to do it too, right, Dan? Uh, yes, I, I had five minutes uh, as an amicus in a in a case in uh, 1985, 86, somewhere in that time frame. Was this a, a, a similar situation where Paul kind of threw the ball your way? Uh, um, well, it, I think this was kind of the end of the period when the Solicitor General was willing to let the SEC argue its own cases. Again, this wasn't a, a party case. Um, and I, I think it was kind of traditional, at least up through then, that the general counsel would have an, uh, an opportunity to argue the case. And I, maybe, maybe, maybe the feeling was that this was a case in which I could do the least harm because it, and it wasn't a party case. And I think we felt you know, fairly confident of the outcome. The, the, the case, there were actually two cases together. They involved the question of whether the sale of an entire business, the assets of a business, by transferring 100% of the company's stock was a securities transaction. Uh, and then in the case I heard whether transferring control, transferring you know 50% control uh, by stock was actually a securities transaction or, or was was something outside the securities laws. We, we argued pretty simply, I guess, that since stock transactions were involved, the securities laws applied and we did prevail on that in that case. I, I believe that my successor, Jim Doty, also argued as an amicus in, I think, a Section 16B case. And I'm not aware, and maybe others are, but I'm not aware of anything after that in terms of the somebody from the commission being able to argue in the court. Dan, your period, of course, was the insider trading, the corporate takeover. So, and one of Paul's biggest cases was the Dirks case. Yeah. Yes. I and mean, maybe just for for the record, I, mean, I I don't know if I have a complete list. I, I tried to identify the cases that he argued in. He, he argued in the Foreman case, which involved the definition of a, of a security. Ernst and Ernst versus Hockfelder, the question of whether Scienter was required in a private 10b5. Herman and McLean versus Huddleston, involved the overlap between Rule 10b-5 and Section 11 of the 33 Act, and then the the, uh, the, the Dirks case, Dirks versus SEC. Um, it's certainly true that uh, while I was there, I, I would say insider trading and the regulation of tender offers were kind of the dominant issues in our in our litigation. Dirks exposed something else that I mean, I mean very others on the panel may also have views about, but that's how situations were resolved where the SEC and the Justice Department or the Solicitor General had different views as to how a case should turn out. And again, I, I think if you look over the commission's long history, it went from uh, deference or at least allowing the commission to express its own views to a much stricter view on the Solicitor General's part as to whether the SEC ought to be able to do that or not. But uh, uh, apparently, and I'll, I'll confess at the beginning, I get this from Paul's oral history. I have no recollection of this, but apparently in the uh, Dirks case, uh, Dirks had lost, we can talk about what the, was involved in the case, but Dirks had lost in the Court of Appeals. So he was the petitioner in the Supreme Court and the uh, Solicitor General let a brief be filed opposing cert and reflecting the commission's view, but noting the Solicitor General disagreed. When certiorari was granted, Rex Lee was the Solicitor General at that time, apparently told Paul that he would not permit the SEC to, to file a brief uh, on the merits opposing Dirk's view. And Paul uh, apparently told Rex Lee that if that's your position, I'm going to author, ask the commission to authorize the filing of a brief, and I will file it. 
if the clerk won't take it because the solicitor general hasn't approved the filing, then I'll petition the court for a writ of mandamus to direct the, the clerk to accept the brief. And that way we'll test the proposition as to whether the SEC has the legal authority to express its own views in the Supreme Court independent of the solicitor general. Um, Rex Lee apparently concluded that it wouldn't be prudent for him to test that proposition with, this, with the court. Obviously, if he were to lose, that would undoubtedly open the floodgate system and the other independent agencies litigating independently. So he acquiesced in uh, the commission filing its own brief. And, and Paul did argue in that case. Of course, we, we ended up losing, but that's a, a different story perhaps. Is, does any, anyone have a sense of the dynamic behind that? Why the Supreme Court would have sort of closed the spigot on the SEC, on the solicitors from coming in and arguing cases? Well, I think it may have been a combination of things. I mean, uh, one of the things that a very practical kind of consideration is that the court began taking many, many fewer cases as time went by. And so you had the assistance in the Solicitor General's office, you know, the Solicitor General wanted to give them cases. And so I think there was less interest in uh, allowing others. There's also the sort of tighter control over the, uh, the government, you know, who speaks on behalf of the government and consistency in the arguments that are being made and having that really all be funneled through one uh, voice. And that was the voice of the Solicitor General. So I, I think it's probably a combination of those things, but it is true. We have not, um, we, we work extremely closely with the SG. Um, as David said, you know, we have a great relationship with them. We have for many, many years. Um, and I mean, Jake uh, was so well known, you know, when we go, We'd often be for, but really always, in uh, cases where we were, it was one of our cases, or uh, we were appearing, the government was appearing as an amicus in a securities case. Um, we would go to the moot courts that would be held over at the SG's office. And, um, and Jake, when he would speak, there was a, you know, one of those moments where people around the room would carefully listen to make sure that they got his views because he was so incredibly well respected, you know, and, and there in that office, of course, there are the principal deputies, you know, who have been around for a very long time, you know, Malcolm Stewart and Ed Needler, and until he retired recently, Michael Dreeben, and all of them, you know, had, um, you know, a very good working relationship with, with Jake. And because of that, we had, uh, a kind of a, an entree that I think, you know, at, sometimes at those moot courts, you would see that there'd be different agencies that would be around the table who might have an interest. And um, I don't think it's just my uh, bias to say that uh, you know, in these cases, frequently what our folks had to say was given particular attention. And, uh, and so that's a, it's a really good relationship to, even though we aren't the people who are at the podium. Uh, it would be a mistake to suggest that we don't have a very significant role in cases involving this attorney's law. And I just, just to add to what Michael said earlier, I, as jerks occurred during the Reagan administration, as you said, Rex Lee was the Solicitor General. And, and I, I think they had a, how to express it, a, a philosophy that the independent agencies shouldn't be too independent of the president and the administration. And, and, and Rex Lee, who I think was a terrific and very high integrity guy, I think felt strongly that it was important that the government speak with a single voice in, in the Supreme Court. And, and, and that led to this kind of restriction of the SEC's ability to speak for itself in the court. So, so the Supreme Court and maybe the, the, the glamour uh, shot. But how about the, the courts of appeals? Um, wh what was the experience there? How did how did the approach of the solicitor's office differ there? Um, how did the the types of cases differ? 
Well, I can only speak to my tenure, uh, which was really when uh, the, the solicitor title was more of an honorarium and a, and a gesture of respect than uh, necessarily a organizational division of labor. Uh, and I have to say that in my role as general counsel, I rarely got involved in uh, appellate cases, except in well, in some uh, cases, is to skim through the final draft to, to make sure that they wouldn't embarrass uh, anybody. But the product, the product from that office was so good, and the demands of my time were uh, pretty extensive that I you know, I had the luxury of. Uh, relying on the skill of the lawyers in in the uh, uh, in the appellate group. Now we had um, while I was there and before I was there and after I was there, the commission struggled with the whole notion of cost benefit analyses, and uh, I suspect still uh, struggles. I think that. There, at, when I was there, there was a prevailing view that um, cost-benefit analyses did not fit many of the things that we did, and that insistence on them in various pieces of legislation or um, regulatory requirements were um, really a Republican attempt to make the rulemaking process more cumbersome um, and to uh, impose a hoop for um, uh, a successful uh, appellate review. So we had a bunch of cases uh, um, uh, over the years that were bounced by the DC circuit for um, failure to do an adequate um, analysis of costs and benefits, um, thus making our rulemaking decisions arbitrary and capricious. Um, in large part because um, people in some of the divisions thought this um, uh, cost-benefit analysis requirement was bogus. Uh, was not good a good faith requirement. Um, we didn't do very well in the DC circuit, uh, and the DC circuit uh, complained in a couple of cases that we weren't taking this requirement uh, seriously. And in the last couple of times, they were really grumpy. So one of the things that I did when I got there uh, the second time, and we, we had upcoming rulemaking on proxy access issues. And um, uh, uh, my view was, let's, whatever we feel about the, you know, the good faith of all of this, we, we got to do this right. Um, and we have to do our level best um, uh, to do um, to, to to get a very good uh, cost benefit analysis. And we worked with the divisions and with the economic analysis folks, whatever they were called in that um, incarnation, to give the world's most fabulous cost. Uh, benefit analysis that came out with proxy ac access is good for you and will increase. We went to our default benefit of, among other things, increasing investor confidence and hope. Um, and we said, all right, we think we've done the best we can. And if the uh, DC circuit is serious, this one uh, would pass. Well, uh, the panel of the DC circuit whom we uh, had would have none of it. Um, uh, Judge Ginsburg 
uh, wrote the opinion. Now, when I clerked on the DC circuit in 1973 for Judge Leventhal, um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on, on the name. Uh, Judge Ginsburg, uh, where, um, uh, that time not Judge Ginsburg, so not Judge Ginsburg, Doug. For Judge McGowan, Doug, excuse me, Doug, thank you. Uh, Doug Ginsburg clerked for Judge McGowan, and we lived near each other, and so we drove into work uh, frequently together. And I remember two things um, that about Doug at, at that period of time. One is, for recre recreational purposes, he read every advance sheet that came out in the federal system in real time. And that, in my view, was, it was evidence of you know, real dedication and a semi-warped personality. <laughs> um, and the other thing I remember about conversations with Doug is that he would say to me, can you name one thing that the federal government does that's worth anything? And I'd say something, say, no, that's no good. That's for this reason. So Judge Ginsburg comes into this with a, um, a firmly formed view as, as to the utility of the federal government. And of course, this is a time, um, and, and he went to the University of Chicago uh, Law School, was very well versed in economic analysis. So, uh, he wrote the opinion, and it was as if it says, in essence, you guys didn't consider this, you didn't consider that. Um, no, we keep telling you to consider these types of things, out you go. Um, and it was, um, it was ironic because many of the things that uh, we didn't consider were either things that we didn't know about, course you can't consider what you don't know or it didn't ex the court didn't explain why these things were um, uh, um, of any interest and they would say well a newspaper article said this that and the other thing why didn't you consider this so yeah it, it partly goes to show you that you know an important case can be one that you win or, the, or that you lose um, well this turned out to be important First of all, there was a belief in many parts of the, um, uh, the, the rulemaking divisions that we can't win in the DC circuit. So why bother with all these ridiculous requirements anyway? Um, and, and, and it also uh, affected our strategy in um, you know, all sorts of other rulemaking. We're running, we're running short on time, and I want to. I do want to talk about a few cases here before we wrap up, and so I'm going to turn it into a lightning round. And and Dan, throw out a case that you think was important that the solicitor argued uh, something that that made history. Well, it wouldn't be a single case, so maybe not good for a lightning round, but certainly the whole series of insider trading cases. Um, in the Supreme Court, and then the fallout for that on our our litigation in the lower courts was very important during the time that I was general counsel. And the Supreme Court had decided the the Chiarella case, um, which rejected the disclosure abstain philosophy generally based on possession of material non-public information, and kind of launched the commission on developing the misappropriation <clears throat> theory. And that we've already talked about Dirks, which had to do with uh, tippy liability in, set, in insider trading cases and, and launches on a search for uh, personal benefits in, in uh, uh, tipping cases. So again, these, these were examples of Supreme Court decisions that then had a big influence on the enforcement program and on the theories we presented in the courts of appeal with a view to eventually going back to the Supreme Court and, and establishing, for example, the misappropriation theory, which ultimately happened in the, I guess, in the O'Hagan case in the in the 90s. Michael, did you end up uh, dealing with any insider trading cases? 
Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I was just thinking, you know, Dirks was a very important case that was decided, uh, as, as Dan acknowledged, that was a loss for the commission, but it really set up a paradigm for, you know, what is required in establishing liability in tipping cases. And that was 1983, right? And the, and the sort of critical component that the Supreme Court identified was this personal benefit test. In order to say that somebody's gonna be on the hook for having uh, tipped inside information and not be a circumstance like Dirks, where the court basically looked at Dirks as kind of a hero for you know, having exposed uh, serious fraud inside a particular company. Um, they said, well, the way we're gonna tell that is if the tipper is deriving some personal benefit from uh, tipping. And so, and the court gave some examples of that. You know, it can be a pecuniary benefit. You can get a, you know, quid pro quo, the easiest kind of case. But it can also be something where, you know, there can be a reputational benefit, or there can even be a gift that the tipper would be making of the information. And so that was 1983. And for the next, really, about 30 years, there wasn't much that happened in that space that was kind of accepted. Uh, the government, both we and civil cases and the Justice Department and criminal cases were pursuing cases where they would establish what the personal benefit was. But then there were a series of cases that, um, you know, in the uh, mid 2008, 9, 10, 11, where uh, the government was uh, going after not just the original Tippy, but successive Tippy way down the line. And um, and the Second Circuit, I think, became really uncomfortable with just how far removed these ultimate people were from the original tipping who were still being made liable. And so in the Newman case, uh, the court, the Second Circuit, looked at this uh, personal benefit requirement in Dirks and really decided to give it some teeth and said, yeah, you know, this personal benefit, in order for it to really be a basis for liability, there basically has to be a pecuniary benefit, something pecuniary that that uh, is derived from it. And um, shortly after that, that was a big deal, right? Because that, as a consequence of that, there were all these cases that were thrown out um, where they weren't going to be able to establish, the government wasn't going to be able to establish a pecuniary benefit around the same time there was a case in the Ninth Circuit called the Salmon case. And the uh, case was interesting because you, you, there the, the, the tipper was the brother of the tippy. And so this is kind of a, we're back to Dirk's land, you know, where you're saying you can have a gift to a family member. And just by coincidence, one of the judges who was on the panel in the Ninth Circuit sitting by designation uh, was a judge from New York. Um, and, uh, and Judge Raycon. And so and he wrote the opinion in Salmon and said, uh, to the extent that the Second Circuit in Newman is suggesting that this gift isn't an adequate basis, it would be inconsistent with what the court said in terms. And so he was calling out his own circuit from across the country. And then Salmon uh, goes to the Supreme Court uh, and at that point, it was really kind of worse. We didn't know what was going to happen, right? Because the court takes the case. Uh, there was an argument made that, you know, unless you have a pecuniary benefit, there's no way you can really keep track of things. In fact, there were challenges made to uh, tipping liability altogether, constitutional challenges with respect to it. And the Supreme Court uh, came back and said, basically, you know what? Dirks takes care of this. <laughs> this this brother to brother tipping. This is exactly in the in the realm of what Dirks spoke about. And we don't have to go beyond it. That's what it is. And basically, to the extent the Second Circuit is suggesting something different, that would be inconsistent with Dirks. So that can't be good law. So there you have you know decades apart. You know we were involved in both. You know both Dirks we lost. We were heavily involved in the Salmon case when it went back to the Supreme Court, and things turned out okay. Let's look at another another issue decades apart. I, I don't want to wrap up without talking about Amicus. 
and I've I've read uh, that I've, I've read the the Supreme the uh, SEC's efforts described as an amicus program or an amicus project. Harvey, when you're in your time in the general counsel's office, would you say that there was some sort of systematic attempt to stake out the boundaries with amicus group? We had a very um, <clears throat> active um, amicus program. We um, actively looked for cases that were significant. Um, there were always a number of concerns. Uh, part of it is that um, uh, those uh, cases might involve pushing the outer boundaries of the law further than the commission thought it could be sustained but also on the part of those fighting a liability, there were concerns that people would argue for too restrictive a view. And so we looked um, uh, actively for cases and um, uh, we solicited them. Um, during uh, the mid seventies, there were a string of Supreme Court cases, many on implied rights of action which were, um, uh, I would say, uh, hostile to uh, any expansion of the securities laws. It got pretty bad because in one Supreme Court case involving 16B, we didn't file an amicus brief, but arguments were made about the commission's position. And the Supreme Court dropped a footnote which said the SEC hasn't filed an amicus brief in this case, but if it had, we wouldn't have paid any attention to its views anyway. Um, uh, I don't know whether subsequent, subsequent to that, people started um, cutting back on the amicus program, but it was, it was definitely uh, quite active and, and um, uh, vigorous, and I even argued um, as an amicus in the Supreme Court uh, during that period in the Bankers Trust case. So um, we had an active approach to it. Michael, would you say that you had an amicus, uh, an amicus program, or I mean, the, the commission is still approached routinely by uh, private parties in cases seeking amicus support. Um, courts will ask us to file amicus briefs, and um, and I think that uh, that that is something which we consider on a regular basis. I will say that a um, couple factors kind of uh, have sort of caused us to shift from the act of seeking out people, uh, you know, or cases where we might participate to just responding when asked. Uh, among them is. Uh, just the sheer volume of requests that we get, uh, and uh, you know, resources. We just we we don't have the resources to respond to everyone that comes in. We do respond, of course, when courts ask us for our views. And I would say the principal way in which we participate as amicus is something I referred to before, which is when uh, there's a case in the Supreme Court, uh, say a private case that involves securities law questions. Almost always the court will ask the government for its views. When the SG is asked, that immediately gets kicked over to us, where we do sort of the principal labor over uh, coming up with a, a position, uh, getting the commissions to weigh in on it, and then ultimately providing a draft to the SG. So that's the, the biggest, I think, involvement we have on an amicus case. We do get... Uh... Well, I mean, when I was there, we, we, we just got tons of requests. At the Supreme Court, always tons of requests from the litigants um, because why not? And, uh, and, you know, there's no costs imposed upon them for asking. And then the other thing that I would mention is that we stayed away from district court cases on the views in the period that they're just – too many of them in the laws, things are likely to change. How do, how do we know what's going on in appellate cases and, and how, who makes the, how do people make a determination whether this is something that we ought to get involved in? 
And that's it's a very good question because I think it's one of the other things that limits the amount of participation we have, which is when we get a request, if it passes an initial threshold that this is a serious issue that we might want to consider asking the commission to be involved in, typically we would have the parties both come in, both sides, make a presentation. And because, of course, this is something that the commission has, by definition, not been involved in and not taken a position on previously in the case, we would have to then go to the commission and ask both whether the commission uh, thinks it's an appropriate case for us to weigh in on, and if so, what position we would take. So it's a it's a substantial endeavor just to, to, to bring this to the commission and get it to consider possibly participating. Just as an outside observer, I wonder if it might be harder to get commission consensus on many of these sort of policy-laden potential amicus positions than it might have been uh, you know, at an earlier time when some of us were, were at the commission. It's certainly possible. Um, th this has been a, a great endeavor. I want to thank you guys. I want to provide you with uh, a last opportunity to give us something to, to take home with us. What should the, the audience um, remember about the SEC and the solicitors and the three gentlemen we've spoken about this evening? Uh, Harvey, you want to go ahead first? T take about a minute. I think um, the most important thing is this is um, a, a significant position at the commission which recognizes unusual talent, talent both in terms of helping formulate agency policy, but also in terms of being able to articulate it. I think the people who have filled that office right up to the current time are people with extraordinary gifts and skills of communication and that has served the commission incredibly well it's also served the various council very very well terrific dan well i think i just say from the from the first day that i walked into the commission in 1974 and into the general counsel's office i i think there was always a sense that the sec was the premier federal regulatory agency and the general counsel's office was the premier law firm within the, the federal government. Um, I, I'm sure that there are many people that would be responsible for that reputation and including the other people on the panel here today. But I, I really kind of think of, of, of the three people we've been discussing, uh, Dave Ferber, Paul Gonson, and Jake Stillman as, as being responsible for that kind of excellence in legal work at the at the commission so I, i'm glad this historical society gave us the opportunity today to to talk about their work david ah uh, i say this is where the law lives at the sec more than any place else it is in its purest form uh we were advocates to be sure um but we felt fully our responsibility to courts and uh, uh, to colleagues and other uh, branches of the government. And, and I'd say this part of the commission acts as true, vigorous advocates in, in the highest traditions of disinterested, vigorous advocacy. Terrific. And Michael? Yes. Um, I, I, I would like to say that, you know, I really find it doubly humbling to be part of this program. First, because even in the brief opportunity we've had to touch on the contributions of Dave, Paul, and Jake, I think it's clear just how extraordinary these people were and the extent of their contributions, both to the agency and to investors. And second, just the chance to join, even remotely, uh, Harvey, Dan, and David, each of whom is really undeniably a lion of the securities bar, who's made, each of whom, too, has made enormous contributions to the agency and the development of the securities laws, is really a great honor. And so um, thank you for making this possible. I have to have to second that, Michael. Uh, it's I've never had such a good time being in the pit with the Lions, but it's been good to be with you this evening. Um, thank you so much for participating in the program. And uh, at this point, nice. let's turn it back to Joan. 
Thank you, Ken. And thank you to the panelists. It was a great and thoughtful discussion. Really enjoyed hearing it. If you know of anyone who is unable to be here today, the Society will be adding this program to the permanent collection of the Virtual Museum soon after today's broadcast. I would be also remiss in my role as chair if I didn't make a plug for your support. Our organization depends on the financial gifts of viewers like you, which enable us to preserve the history of our securities markets with unique programming like today's. If you haven't made a donation this year, we would greatly appreciate your support. Every dollar for our small organization goes a long way. If you're watching this from the Society's website, just click on the Give Today button at the top of this homepage for a list of support options. Thanks again to our panels for their terrific insights and to our viewers for joining us. Have a great evening.